Okay. We are live. So after about half an hour of technical difficulties, <laughs> we're live. Um, so thanks for joining us if you're watching us. And uh, thanks, Julian, for being here with me. Hi, Josh. Um, yeah, it's been it's been great talking to you in the, in the last week or so. We've had a, a couple of chats, and um, it's very, very interesting what you're doing. So let me introduce a little bit. Um, uh, Julian is um, uh, runs the organize one of the organize uh, man. Now I'm stressed from all the technical difficulties. Sorry. Okay. So Julian runs um, Map Black Systems, which is a aeronautics um, parts manufacturer. And um, I guess you took over the business about fifteen years ago, and. That's right, yeah. um, since then, or in the sort of first early years, when you realized there were some difficulties with the business, you transformed it to a self-managing business. And um, you didn't do that necessarily intentionally from the beginning, but we'll, we'll talk about that. But it's been, um, it's been, it's been a, a long journey and you've got a lot to say about it. Um, and it's very, very interesting, actually. So um, what would I say? Uh, Julian is an engineer by background. Um, when he is a, the map like systems was a family business that I guess um, your father founded and um, in the 70s. yeah in the 70s and so um, you were originally were interested in in or you were kind of forced into the business and you thought you weren't sure whether you wanted to or not and you decided that actually maybe you would start become a psychologist so you started studying psychology and then you thought maybe you'd become a counselor and you started studying counseling and in the end you realized that actually the creativity of engineering was something that you really, really enjoyed. Yeah, um, I missed it when I wasn't doing it. And you missed it when you weren't doing it. Yeah. And and then when you came into the business, you realized actually there's a whole lot of stuff. You you, you can actually be an engineer because you actually have to be a manager. <laughs> you have to work on the business rather than in it. Yeah. So and it okay, so let's let's jump jump into it. Um it's a really interesting story, and and let me also say, and this I put this in the description on the uh, on the Facebook event, but um, this has kind of gained a lot of interest from people around the world. Um, the BBC interviewed you, I think, this year and uh, earlier this year, yeah. And uh, and and there's a lot of interest now, and and I think um, Frederick Lalou with his book Reinventing Organizations, Organizations sparked a lot of interest, um, and people have been knocking on your door asking, hey, what have you been doing? And um, yeah. So, so. I should start off by saying that self-management is not a way of doing things. Yeah. It's, we have a way that we do it, but really there's a, as many ways of doing it as there are people. Mm. So I'm not here as some sort of a, a guru on self-management. I'm very passionate about it, and I'm very passionate of, about how we do it. But ultimately, how you should do it, is up to you. That's why it's called self-management. So we started on a journey 15 years ago now, and it wasn't a journey of self-management. We didn't start off in that direction. We ended up there because nothing else worked more than anything else. So we didn't we didn't start off from an, an ideological perspective of saying this is how an idealized organization should work and therefore everyone should do it like this and we just have to work it out and it'll be great we started in a very conventional route first of all um i should present a bit of a background there we were in crisis mm -hmm. this wasn't done out of a sheer ideological perspective we were in crisis we had uh, very poor productivity um we had very poor delivery performance in our products and there's an enormous amount of rework going on internally to make sure the product was good enough to release to the customers. Um, and I've tried an enormous amount of things to, to overcome those problems, but nothing ever seemed to shift. Um, we had a, cu a culture, really, that was very self-serving. The, the reason why we did things was usually for some internal reason. The reason why somebody asked you to do something or told you to do something was because it suited them. We we're often bouncing off each other in terms of the, the demands on the business and not very focused on the customer's interests. Do you know how that is? And some, sometimes when you're at work, you kind of ask yourself, well, why are we doing this? 
And the answer is because our system says so. And it's not because our customers demanding that you do it. So we were kind of, in that sense, our culture was quite selfish, quite inward looking. And so we set about the, the task of kind of getting control of this. And so we, the business was kind of out of control. You know, it's kind of a, a, a bit of a muddle. So logically, we thought we'll, we'll put more control in place. I mean, that, that makes logical sense, doesn't it? If something's out of control, you put more control in to, to kind of hold it firm. Mm -hmm. So we, first of all, we put more, um, more advanced and more uh, uh, skilled management in place, a bigger management team and a higher qualified management team. And then that didn't work. In many ways, that caused more chaos. You know, it was a whole... I'm, gonna, I'm a new broom and I'm sweeping clean kind of concept. And it just caused lots and lots of animosity within the organization. Mm. So then we tried to standardize things. You know, so we, we, we rip out all those um, kind of systems that have grown up over time, but we fixed and made them firm. We standardized and we said, this is how we do this now. It's a much more professional way of doing it rather than being ad hoc. Mm -hmm. It was all a controlled, organized mechanized sort of process that didn't work more often than not it was counterproductive we tried introducing lots of management so we ended up dividing our management roles into two and then dividing them again into four trying to micromanage everything that went on to to, to absolutely take control of this this really slippery monster mm -hmm. yeah, that didn't work either but now you know, we'd ended up with a, a fourth problem that we were broke now because of all this money we were pouring into our admin team. So one thing that happened to us on that way, we'd started to explore with lean manufacturing. It's a process of waste reduction based on a, a Japanese principles. Mm -hmm. And most of us in manufacturing are, have dabbled with this. It's a very old technology globally. In fact, it's very old technology in the West, but it's still being introduced now because we're not making a very good job of it, in all honesty. So we keep having another go. And we failed, but we found something very interesting in the, in the process. And that was, there was nothing wrong with the tools we were introducing. There was a problem more with the, with the mechanic who was wielding the tools. Yeah. And there was something wrong with his focus. I'm not saying he was dizzy, but I'm, I'm saying that he... His interests, his best interests, weren't necessarily aligned with the business's best interests. So, for example, we paid overtime. So there was an inherent interest he he had in having low productivity because it meant the project was behind, and then he got overtime, which meant more money. Yeah. So we had a we had a very dysfunctional culture that was was built out of out of all sorts of rules in the system, which were which seemed to patch a problem, but were in fact motivated people to do the, 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 the wrong thing. But I don't want to focus too much on you know, the guys doing the work. There's also an executive team who had final salary pension schemes who didn't want to change anything because mm -hmm. they too had a vested interest in the status quo. And really, no matter how we intervened, it was very difficult to get any traction for any change. And you, you, you change something and it would just move back to where it was, as if by magic. Yeah. So we worked out there's, there's got to be some, there's some pressure to, to return it to its previous state. Mm. It didn't just go somewhere else. It just ended back where it started from, as if magically, magnetically attracted back to its starting point. Mm. And we started to figure then something else is going on that we really don't understand. So we spent a year arguing about what that could be and how we could fix it. And after about a year, we realized that we just didn't know what was going on and nobody had a solution to it. Mm -hmm. So we started to think very laterally about the essence and the, and the, the philosophical perspective of our challenge because we had nothing else. It wasn't like we'll just pick up another book. Mm -hmm. so, so, and we didn't want to go down this road of just trying something new because because we already knew most of these things wouldn't work. Mm. So we started to realize that 
the reason our culture was the way it was was because of all the rules and systems we put in place often to patch problems during the past and then aggregated into a set of rules which were really dysfunctional and that got dysfunctional behavior now if i work down on the shop floor it would be absolutely logical for me that i do exactly the same dysfunction yeah it wasn't because these were bad people in fact they were really good people it's just that we created a very dysfunctional environment for, in which they existed yeah okay that's a and that's a sort of a very interesting insight i think because it, you, you could and i think this is one of the things what they talk about in terms of um teal organizations is that you have to assume that people are actually doing the best they can yeah in the constraints that they have and a traditional organization might look at that and say well let's fire everybody and hire some new people clearly we have a surely people do what they're told yeah and, it, and it's a completely silly way of looking at it yeah and there's some great tv programs where the boss goes back on the floor and he quickly realizes that the motivations of the guys on the shop floor are, are just as profoundly um, engaged as he is but they worry about completely different things they worry about the rules and regulations they see from underneath rather than his perspective from on top yeah things look a lot different from underneath yeah. so we then went back to the best tools we had which was these lean tools and we still couldn't make any sense we did some experiments and they didn't pay off mm. Um, and there were some stressors now because we were running out of money. So we thought, right, right, okay, quick, what, what can we do? And we ended up going back to the Japanese books about lean. And the Japanese books, rather than the American translations of them, the Japanese books had a fundamentally different message. And when we went to the original Japanese, you know, the grandfathers of lean, they talked about the engaging the workforce. They, for example, when they set standards in the workplace, they get the operator to write the standard. Mm. Now, the American version is the supervisor writes the standard and he applies it to the operator. In the Japanese version, it's considered that the operator is the expert on this, so he writes the standard. Mm. And if he doesn't follow the standard, that's a weird thing because he wrote it. Why isn't he following it? Mm -hmm. So can you see there's a subtle difference in the self-determination of the Japanese worker and the American worker is almost seen just as a, a resource, a, a thing. Yeah. The supervisor really has only got the brains to work out how to do the job and the worker just follows instructions. Yeah. The Japanese view of the worker is quite different to that. Mm. It, now, sounds, just, it sounds like um, what I just noticed is that with um, lean lean manufacturing the the principles underlying it are are you know you could call them authentic organizational principles but when they were translated by practitioners in the us who didn't have an understanding of the underlying principles um they sort of you know copied some things changed some things but they changed all the wrong things basically i think you're right i think you're right josh i think there's also an element of they had to meet the american culture the american working culture with yeah these tools they were trying to introduce and some of them were really poor fits so they kind of said well we'll, we'll adjust it and it, it'll kind of be the same yeah. you know the words are different and in a different order but they're kind of the same they're still a standard and that's good huh mm. but the truth is they've robbed the operator of the ownership of that standard and that was again making that operator look from the underneath rather than on top Now, the other thing that the uh, Japanese did in their lean technology was they would make multifunctional cells. So you have a little cell, a work cell, which was focused on doing a product, usually. They call them value streams. And instead of doing just one operation, like, like you know, turning something or milling something, they would do, in this little Japanese cell, they would do all the operations on something. And also do some of the administration, the internal administration of it as well. So they'd kind of be in charge of procuring the materials for it and the inspection and possibly even dispatch. So that was a, they integrated administrative roles in the work cell. Yeah. And the office in the West and the workshop were very divided. 
but in these Japanese cells they weren't they were they really constrained all of the costs of an operation into the area where it was done so you could tell whether it was making a profit or not so at the same time as drilling down these standards and 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 setting uh, uh, constraints on the organization they were also saying well you have to deal with the financial constraints at the same time you have to make a profit doing what you're doing mm. and it stopped one area of the business having to subsidize another so you'd have a little work cell where there's four operators and a host of machines and a computer and a somebody from the sales department and somebody from the admin say the accounts department working in that same cell and really that didn't leave a lot that had to be then transmitted out of that cell it was just mainly the profits mm -hmm. so they had purchasing they had accounts and they had um, uh, uh, their, their internal um, logistics all in, within the cell as well as the guy making the thing mm -hmm. when we make they made that leap of drilling down to very small cells we saw a profound change in behaviors because no longer were people <clears throat> motivated by the simple rules and regulations they were seeing the overall overarching constraints of the balance sheet and PL account in their little area they had to make what they were doing work yeah. if it didn't work if they made a loss there was clearly this idea well we'll make a profit and then the pressure goes away from us so we saw suddenly a degree of change we hadn't seen before so very poor performance as far as the customer concerned disappeared Wow. because they were now talking to a customer they were now thinking about the financial constraints of their operations and they were becoming slicker and slicker and really pulling in a lot of those tools that we would failed to be able to um, uh, put onto them previously we, we were imposing them previously and now they're pulling them in it's as though instead of seeing from underneath they're now seeing from on top the big view right. of their situation and the result of which was they had a profoundly different um, uh, uh, results both in terms of productivity and profitability and also a new sense of engagement in what they were doing does that does that make sense they, they, there's a kind of a sense of ownership right because they because they're now we're acting kind of like entrepreneurs i guess kind of in a very basic way at that time but yeah. it was the first thing we did that we got a result mm. it had been awful up to that point it'd been just a a series of disasters mm. you know i can sit here saying to you of course i've worked all this out <laughs> I'm an expert here but the truth is it was through a cat a catalog of failures josh it, i can't claim to have had, have had any grand insight at the beginning yeah. i've made enough mistakes to know what didn't work and we stumbled across a few things that did work and you know we fiddle with the things that did work and tried to make them better yeah and do more of them even at times when I was convinced it wouldn't work, we tried it. Yeah. But a good example is, of this is we we decentralized purchasing. That makes no sense. Yeah. That definitely wasn't going to work. I, I, I knew that. Right. You would lose economies of scale and oh, all sorts of things like that, that's right? A stupid idea, Josh. <laughs> I mean, if you were a consultant, I definitely, you know, probably not going to get paid. But, <laughs> um, you know, in the spirit of thinking, well, we might as well try it just to prove that it doesn't work we did it and we didn't do it everywhere we just piloted it in a certain couple of cells to see what would happen and, and prove that it was a stupid idea mm -hmm. uh, it worked brilliantly mm -hmm. so that leaves us scratching our head thinking well how come this has worked and when we looked into the data because we were very strict on the data we were raising we saw we were, we were purchasing better the, the parts were coming in more consistently they were coming at the time or just before we needed them, mm -hmm. rather than after we needed them. Um, or and months we, before you need them. Yeah, or months before we, we needed them, so we just sat on them in the stores. Yeah. And also they were, um, the accuracy of our ordering just improved dramatically. Mm. Uh, uh, there's, there's kind of three or four advantages there, but in fact there were probably 20 advantages, which included the fact that the guy purchasing knew what he was buying where before we had a purchasing manager who bought the part number. Yeah. Now, so instead of buying a 4323X, he's buying 
you know, a widget and he knows what the widget does and he, he communicates with the guy at the other end who sells widgets. And do you know, he really, really is interested in widgets because he sells and that's his life. <laughs> now a guy buying it says, oh yeah, no, I, what other sorts of widgets you do? And we got a much, much better uh, purchasing performance. We got the right thing and often they were able to choose from a catalog the best thing in the catalog rather than just the part number. Yeah. So that's a good example of you can't always guess your way, can't always be inspired and use your best uh, thought to predict the future. Sometimes you just got to do things even when you think they're going to be wrong. Mm. You learn so much, especially on the things you think are going to be wrong. That's a very, that sounds like a very hard lesson to learn to to you know to say well your first thought might be wrong and, and just try it out look I, I i i've been 30 years in industrial design and the best judge of, of an idea is always reality mm -hmm. you make something you put it on test and it fails or, or it doesn't and it doesn't really matter in fact my experience teaches me not to get too wedded to how good my idea is i can be passionate for it but ultimately the test is going to prove whether the idea is good enough. It's not how it's not how enthusiastically I I believe in it. Mm. It's just whether it works or not. So we then started to pick up some speed along this direction of of um, devolving all our functions down to individual individuals in the organisation. And um, every time we did more of that, we got a, a, a huge result. Yeah. And by huge results, I mean, we used to battle to gain 5% and now we're getting 15% benefits of, of doing this. Mm. And we eventually, we stood on that precipice and said to ourselves, right, do we do the obvious final step? And that's devolve our entire organizations into teams of one. <laughs> Look, I, I understand that, you know, teamwork and collaboration is the most important part of any organization. And it seems senseless to me to individualize people to such a degree you now had teams of one yeah that was sure that was definitely counterproductive <laughs> definitely wasn't going to work okay eh? right so we tried it At that point we got a massive improvement huge improvement and a huge step up in the engagement of the of the um of everybody yeah and curiously our culture leapt on in two phases. First of all, people individualized in many ways. They got on with what they did. They kept themselves a little bit isolated from everybody else, head down, saying to themselves, look, I've got a good job here. Business is in difficulties, but I've got a job here which I know is profitable and, and I've got a, a, a job as long as I keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And within a short while, even the areas which weren't so good, people improved they stepped up to a reasonable level yeah but it had a it had a dramatic influence on our profitability suddenly and we got back in control of a, a very out of control situation we yeah. breathed a sigh of relief fantastic but then as that as that perspective matured quite quickly the individuals realized they were much better off when they collaborated yeah now that was the key because they're much better off in teams, but it took us to break all those dysfunctional teams apart and for them to reform in new ways as functional teams and suddenly huge leap. Mm. So the guys were right. Teamwork is essential, but they were wrong putting people into teams. Right. It's sort of like, it's better to not have a team than have a highly dysfunctional team. Fantastic. Yeah. And the, I suppose the biggest, the essence of it is you, a voluntary team is the one you want. Mm. not yeah. the one where you're you're chosen you volunteered josh to fit into team b yeah and it makes i mean it makes perfect sense right if if i can choose the people that i work with i'm going to be you know not only choose people that are better suited to me but also i'm going to be much more committed to that team because i chose it and yeah. there's yeah. a host of reasons and in many ways we looked upon the outcome is more important than the mechanism that's going on inside and then we start to say actually this mechanism is far more sophisticated and you can sit down and work it out yeah and it's kind of pointless 
working out why it's happening. You just want to focus on, okay, what's, what's the, have I got to arrange things so it does happen? What makes it happen better and more rather than exactly tell me how it's happening? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, there are things you can't explain, but you do know how to get it to happen. And you're better to focus on how to get it to happen than you are working out exactly why it happens, especially when it's something that changes all the time. I'll give you an example of that. If you go out in the rain and the raindrop falls on your head, you could spend an age working out exactly where in the cloud that raindrop came from. Hmm. It's not a particularly useful exercise. No. Take the raincoat. That would be a better solution <laughs> to the whole problem rather than trying to avoid that particular raindrop. And maybe it links back to this whole idea of gurus, right? Then at the end, you might have the guy saying, oh, let's do a rain dance. You know, it'll make the rain go. Exactly, because there's all sorts of mystical explanations of why that raindrop fell on your head. Yeah. yeah. Don't worry about that. Just take a coat. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so in that was probably 10 years ago. We, we, we stumbled into this world of as much self-determination as we could get. And... and Probably over five years after that, we spent time just looking at different functions of the business, like payroll and, and like uh, purchasing and ordering stuff and, and selling stuff and our account system and our HR system and looking at, well, what do we need to do to, to bring those into line with this new philosophy we were working on, which we now call self-management. But that time, it was just a crazy world that nobody else was doing or we didn't know anybody was doing it that way yeah. and it's really tempting in that in that time to think well I've got to create a new set of rules haven't I mm. I mean I've got one set of rules that tells people what to do and now I'm getting rid of those so I it's logical we need another set of rules to make people do what they're supposed to do mm. and but the great lesson of lean manufacturing is you only do what you have to do mm-hmm so we went all the way back to what do we have to do forget for a moment the products we make but what are the laws that constrain how we work and it turns out well we started on the process thinking there wouldn't be many but it turns out there, there are hundreds mm -hmm. things like counting the law you know the the proper tracking of your, the assets and liabilities of your business that's usually done in the accounts department but honestly, most of their activities is driven by law. When they set you a budget, that's not the law. But the law does say they've got to carefully track what happens to the assets of the business because they're shareholders' property. Mm. Not only that, they can be su uh, suppliers' property too. They've delivered you a product and you haven't paid them yet. So they're not always shareholders' property. Sometimes they're suppliers' property. Mm -hmm. The customer may have paid you for the goods before you delivered them. Effectively, they're your customer's property. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not easy just to blame the whole shareholder motivation. Sometimes you have to see this in a bigger picture and say, actually, there are some laws to protect stakeholders of the organization. Yeah. And you have to make sure you meet those laws. Right, even environmental laws to protect the, the environmental stakeholder, so to speak. Fantastic, yeah. So we've got this, we've got this liquid. Can you pour it down the drain? Now, you either tell the operator, you mustn't do this or you must do that, or you refer him or her to the law that controls this particular material. And it or he or she becomes an expert on what you can and can't do with this liquid then. They see the problem of this liquid from above rather than seeing it from underneath like you've told them what to do yeah i I've, i find this idea of fascinating and really useful i think also because we I, we were talking about this last week that if you um you know if there if there's a if, if as, as it is as it is right now many companies are not aware of the law or it's certainly only small people a small percentage of people in the company are right the the legal department they're the ones who are responsible for knowing what the law is right? hr i mean surely <laughs> they're the only ones who know the hr law but yeah. that shouldn't be true should it yeah and then but then it sort of creates this dysfunction where everybody's breaking the law until somebody sees that you're breaking the law and says, hey, wait a second, that's not, you know, the HR person says to a manager, no, you can't fire somebody like that, that's illegal, right? Um, and so constantly people are breaking the law inside companies. And so 
um, the, then, then sort of it creates this dysfunctional thing in greater society. Then politicians, um, because the law isn't working, because most people aren't following it, then they create more laws and it creates more complexity than is actually necessary, right? And it becomes all internal rules. We create these patches for when a, a law is broken. So the accounts department can't, it's kind of their law or the HR department, it's kind of their law. So they have to create a rule internally so people don't break their law. Because the manager doesn't get told off, it's the HR department who has seemed to break the law. They've allowed it to happen in their organisation. Does that make sense? So yeah, so they have to create strict controls and they have yeah. to create oversight and all. Yeah, oh, fantastic! Yeah, and now they micromanage everything. <laughs> so in many ways, what you do is you you back away in self management as far as you possibly can, yeah. and you back away all the way to the wall that's behind you. And that wall is the actual law. Mm -hmm. And then you say, right, well, what I've got to do is I've got to project into the organization just that law. There should be nothing of me in it. Mm. It shouldn't be. This is the law. But Julian says, <laughs> it shouldn't be that, right? It should just be, well, this is the law. Read it for yourself. Here's a website you can go on to read it. Yeah. A slick way of meeting the requirements of the law is this. But you can meet it any way you like. We, we've thought this is a slick way, but it's up to you. You're a self-managing person. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to, to formalize every law that you, you can identify that you must follow. And these have got nothing to do with your products usually. Mm -hmm. And they're the same for every business. Mm -hmm. But primarily, um, they're the constraints that you have to somehow decant into your business. They shouldn't have anything of you in it. Yeah. Because they're the laws set by somebody else and everyone in the organization's got to follow them. And it doesn't matter whether you're CEO or the janitor, you've all got to meet the same laws. Mm -hmm. There's no get out of jail free, you know, well, unless you're in banking. Um, <laughs> but there's no get out of jail free for anybody. The same law applies to everybody. So then so we thought there was gonna be a few dozen of these. Because we muddled along, like most, you know, there can't be that many, surely. No, there are hundreds. <laughs> and, and people look at our system and say, blimey, you've got a lot of rules in your organization. We don't have anywhere near as many. <laughs> and I think, yeah, but none of them are mine. <laughs> of the couple of hundred, like a dozen are ours. Yeah. And pretty quickly in a self-managing organization, that couple of dozen, you have groups in there governance meetings talk about how they can best what the best practices are between them to, to reduce risk in the organization and it requires like a couple of dozen rules mm -hmm. the other couple of hundred rules are all based on the law yeah. and people come rushing in and say oh this law has changed we've got to be thinking about how we're going to meet this requirement mm -hmm. but there's nobody saying well you know julian said this they pulled that off the website because they've been told that the law's changed yeah it makes so, you much more responsive, doesn't it, to the environment when you are directly linked to the law. So we've stepped back as far as we possibly could from everything not discretionary. But that left us having to specifically address each law that we had to conform to. So, for example, somebody, somebody takes an order over the telephone and uh, they write down a credit card number. And they think, oh, I'll, I'll process that and you know, process the order and it will be good. Um, but they get another surprise telephone call, they deal with that, it's time to go home, off they go. The next day, they're off at a, a, a conference, and effectively, they're contravening the Data Protection Act, because they've left this credit card number for more than a certain amount of time, they've, with, they've held the data, and they haven't looked after it. So that's a typical example of a law you've got to address. It's no good not thinking about that sort of thing. So it's relatively easy to all decide how you're going to put that in place so that data, capturing it and processing it happens in one go. Yeah. And that's how you meet the law. So we say, look, you meet the law either by meeting the law or you could use this slick process where you capture the credit card number, you process it, and the job is done. Yeah. It's up to you how you achieve that, but this is quite a slick one. When people start... They often will follow the, the slick rules. Mm -hmm. 
and once again for a little while they'll adapt them to their own mm. style and you have quite a you've got a software system inside the company that makes a lot of these things quite easy yeah I, I think one of the biggest things that have made self-management possible in today today's age is IT systems mm. and the ability for what we call situation awareness you can share data across different departments and different areas of the business in real time. Yeah. So if you look at most self-managing systems, most self-managing approaches, they've all got some bespoke piece of software that makes that really, really um, helpful. Mm. And uh, most of us in this field make that software available for other people who want to use it. Mm. Um, because it, it's kind of key to maintain that situational awareness across an organization. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how you reach decisions, but having information is key. Any information asymmetry um, distorts decision making. Yeah. And so how, how fast does that software change and improve over time? Or how much? Our software is entirely customizable for each individual. So yeah. they're, they're constantly um, evolving it to be as slick as possible. And if they change the operations, they will remove parts of it quickly and, and focus on the, the core parts they need and develop new bits. Mm -hmm. So we wanted a very flexible and, and adaptable system, but by the individual. It right. wasn't a centralized. It's a platform that communicates between everybody. Yeah. But each person's, uh, each person's uh, personal platform gets to be customized just as they want it. Right. Does that make sense? Um, sort of. I, I'm imagining it sort of a, like um, it, it's sort of a node-based system. Everybody has their own version of their platform, and they sort of have a protocol to interact with the other platforms. Fantastic. Yeah. So exchange of data is very easy. Right. But it's just your operations can be customized to suit your preferences. Hmm. And, and when you develop it, you you, you mean like the actual so like people are programming it? Do you, is there IT people that you have in-house, or how does that work? We developed the framework with an external uh, coder, mm -hmm. but the framework was designed to be adaptable. Uh, we call it like Lego, mm -hmm. you know, the child's construction toy, that the blocks are injection molded and it's a system, but basically anybody can put it together any way they like. Mm -hmm. But my toy and your toy will click together Okay, so we, we can transfer data around our system without it um, having to be translated into each node. And as it comes in, it imports into a set, uh, into a, a set places in each person's platform. Mm -hmm. It's just that they operate in the way they want to. So I'll give you a real example. It's better to do that than fuss about with it, trying to explain it philosophically. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you... Um, manufacture something which has to meet a very strict aerospace standard mm -hmm. you have to carefully trace all the components you use and, and know their provenance and i make something which is entirely commercial i make stickers mm -hmm. now our platform allows us to share data all around but your operations are constrained by the regulatory standard you're working to and I don't have the constraints on mine. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot more freedom because I've chosen to make stickers, whereas you've got a lot less freedom because you've chosen to make aerospace components. Mm -hmm. And you've configured your platform to meet your requirements, and I've configured mine to meet mine. You can sell your part for $1,000, but I can only sell mine for $10. I've got to make a lot more, and I need a very slick process of doing it. You need a very rigorous process. Mm. So you customize yours to do your thing, I customize mine to do mine, and yet we can share the overall data for our organization. Mm. So when we make a decision about purchasing a pool car, we both know where we stand in the, in the, in the use of that pool car, in the finance we've got available, and, and what resources we've got, um, and who's going to use it, and all those sorts of things. Mm. So I can tell or well, the system, I can put in my driving license details and it'll, I can book onto the pool car because I'm allowed to drive it. Where well, the guy who's been banned from driving can't drive it. Because mm -hmm. so that sort of data can be shared easily. 
but we've both got quite different systems under the, uh, um, on the surface, but under the hood they're the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So software is important, and probably the biggest reason why self-management is available now. And it, there was a barrier to it before because everything was done on paper thirty years ago. Yeah. And there's there's too much of a barrier to automating admin. Yeah. yeah, and that sort of kind of brings us to maybe the next question I kind of wanted to talk about was, um, you say that management now is done by everybody. It used to be done by managers, but now everybody's a manager. Yeah. What are, what are the things that people do now that, that managers used to do? So some people call leaders, leaderless organizations like managerless mm -hmm. in a way that nobody tells you what to do nobody tells anybody what to do anymore but that's a bit of a misunderstanding because often what you we see is that management actually goes up in intensity <laughs> but they're not done by particular people generally it's done by yourself just like you manage your own life hmm. so there's a lot of management input but they're the same people doing the work as well hmm. the, the result is that each individual person doesn't have to pay somebody else to be a manager for them. And there's a huge reduction in costs. Probably 50% of our costs, our labor costs, were the management team and their offices and their perks and their pensions and everything else. And that's completely gone. Mm -hmm. So how do we compete? Very easily. Our costs undoubtedly are the lowest in our industry. Well, wow. yeah. And everybody in our organization makes a profit. So it's difficult to work out why you wouldn't be the most competitive company in the industry. And we probably pay three times higher wages than, the, than our competitors. We expect different things from our employees, but uh, the pay rates are phenomenal. Mm. And also, the opportunities in the outside world for our guys is phenomenal as well, because we talked about those laws. Well, every company's got to conform to those laws. Yeah. So our guys are fantastic entrepreneurs. They can go out and move out into any other industry. Mm. And they could be proficient managers. So, you know, we have to pay them a lot to keep them. Yeah. But we don't pay them. They earn the money and they keep some of it and the rest they give to the organization as a whole. Yeah, yeah. So it's What's kind that? of Subtle yeah. difference. Was it? I think was it Peter Drucker who said, you know, you, you should train your employees. You should develop them so far that they can leave easily. Yeah. And then you should create an environment so that yep. they want to stay anyway. And I've effectively made myself redundant from the organisation. There's no role for me there. Even in crisis, there's not a role for me. Mm -hmm. It's it's so resilient now. Everyone can yeah. deal with. Yeah. We had some. Uh, we had a giant fire. Well, next door had a giant fire. And um, it was an arson attack by a disgruntled employee <laughs> from the from the company next door. Yeah. They didn't have self management. They didn't have self management. <laughs> so the guy came in the middle of the night and he switched their alarm off and he set fire to the business. <laughs> and um, the smoke seeped through the the walls, the dividing wall be between our factories, and set our fire alarm off. Mm. So the fire brigade pitched up and they smashed our windows and they pumped water into our building. Oh. It was two hours before they realized they were not getting ahead of the fire. <laughs> Smoke was now pouring out of next door as well. So they turned attention of next door. 20 minutes later, the fire was out. Mm. But they did a million pounds worth of damage to our business. And if, if you look back at our financial performance over the last decade, there's one year where our performance didn't rise, but actually flatlined. And that was a year of this giant fire and it was so bad that our insurance company said we'll give you a final settlement to close the business because this sort of incident usually destroys the business mm -hmm. and looking back on our financial performance you can hardly spot where it occurred and, and i did almost nothing to resolve those that situation i dealt with the insurance company that's all i did mm -hmm. the whole of the reconstruction process was done by the the, the uh, people in the organization so in terms of resilience, not only do they stand firm in the face of perturbation,
but when something really strange happens, they're also able to make up on the fly an appropriate response and deal with something completely out of the blue. It wasn't exactly black swan, but it was a, it was something they certainly didn't expect the day before. Yeah. Yeah. So engage people. Uh, it's an interesting reflection because our engaged people were a fantastic asset to each other and, and to the organization as a whole. Mm -hmm. But a disengaged person next door was a massive liability for that company. Mm -hmm. And to, to yours as well. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't, you, can't, you can't stop the outside world stressing you like that. It will do. You, there's a surprise around every corner. Yeah. And the resilience and robustness is something you've got to design in. Mm -hmm. And it works really well when you've got every person in the organization has their brains engaged in the problem rather than waiting to know what to do next. Yeah. That, that sort of, that's a, again, a great bridge to the topic of authenticity, which is something that um, kind of we, I've named this, you know, idea authentic organizations and we run a conference on authentic personal development and, you know, authenticity is really just, you know, we, we explain it like instead of managing the expectations from the outside world in a very reactive way, you, bring your own identity and self and skills and whatever it is that you have to the world in a proactive way. And it sounds like that's pretty much what your employees are able to do. Yeah. That's great when you say my employees, that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you don't think of them that way. I don't, but you know, it's great when you say it. Yeah. <laughs> Make you feel in control again. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably tell them what to do tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I hope they don't tell me what to do as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So authenticity, now, but this, this is a double-edged sword, Josh, because if you have an organization like McDonald's, you want everybody to kind of conform to a standard to ensure quality for the customer experience. Mm. But when you embrace authenticity, people are going to pitch up at work and be who they are. Now that's a bit tricky now, because how can you guarantee the customer experience? What if they're grumpy one day? Mm. Do they have to smile and just be happy, or can they say, no, I'm pissed off today? <laughs> and we found uh, the outcome is so much better when people are authentic. But you have to give up all those notions of, they should be the way I think they should be. Mm. And you know that phrase, they have the work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And people always mind about how much of their work invades their personal life. I'm thinking about work on a Saturday evening, and that's just not right, is it? Mm. And the truth is, they spend most of their life at work thinking about their home life. Mm. It works both ways. Mm. That's not a surprise, is it? But we often just don't think of it that way. That's a great phrase by uh, Homer Simpson, wasn't it? That um, he was ill during vacation. And how unlikely is that? That must be like a million to one, wasn't it? <laughs> You're only ever ill during work time. Um, and it's true that people bring their ups and downs, their happiness and sadness to work. Yeah. And it's very clear from our point of view, because we measure people, that the things they're going through in their personal life really affect their performance at work. Mm. Now you have to, as, a, as somebody who's introduced as a self-managing organization, you have to accept that. That's the, that's kind of the, that shows your organization is being authentic. That shows that person is being real, if you like, at work. Because the whole person is pitching up. Mm -hmm. Look, the truth is, eBay's numbers will prove that most people trade on eBay during work time. It's not like they're focused solely on doing your work. You know, when you go up and see what they're doing, they're always out working really hard. And yet, so much traffic goes on eBay during the, the working day. Right. So this is happening anyway. And we're, we're sort of playing a game of pretend, aren't we? You know, like... Yes. <laughs> and who does that help? No. And I come back to that point where people are quite self-serving at work. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the management, it's everybody. So... When people are, are authentic, you know, I'll go into into uh, the factory and they'll be playing table tennis. 
but so what? I know that they are the most productive workforce in our entire um, industry. Yeah. Why would I worry about them playing table tennis? Yeah. If, if I, I thought I could get that productivity and they played table tennis all the time, I'd encourage them to do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not how it is, you know. They they say, look, I'm, we we're going to work together. So let's negotiate that. But why not do it over table tennis? So I'm trying to illustrate that there's so much you've got to give up. And often managers and and entrepreneurs themselves are quite like control freaks. Yeah. So you have to give people the space. I call it designing the void. You have to design the space for people to occupy and allow them to occupy and do whatever they want. You have to translate translate those laws into the organization so nobody breaks a law because that could shut you down. But after that, you just design a space that people can operate functionally in. And if they operate dysfunctionally, do you know there's probably something wrong with the space you've designed? Yeah. So, and I don't think it requires any mystical explanation of how all this works. Mm. I use the analogy of saying it's a difference between a, a traffic light control junction, a stoplight control junction, crossroads, and a roundabout. In America, they call them rotaries. Mm -hmm. And you can see in the traffic light control junction, you conform and comply to the instructions that the lights give you. Yeah. In the roundabout, you learn to collaborate and cooperate with people on it. It requires no there's no mystics in the middle of the roundabout that, that make it all happen. Yeah. As Chuck Blakeman says, there's no woo-woo crap in it. <laughs> it's just people doing what they do and they muddle along together. And roundabouts transmit 40% more traffic and have half as many accidents. Yeah, it's incredible. You would assume that, it, you know, or, or uh, traditionally you might assume that a, a traffic light has less accident because it's more controlled. But of course, probably the reason it has less and more accidents is because if the uh, traffic lights go down and people just drive right straight into each other, right? Well, I'm going to come back to selfishness. Mm. The reason why accidents happen on traffic lights is either people ignore what they're told, in other words, jump a light, yeah. or they don't pull away when the green comes on and every person behind thinks they do. So they drive into the back of them. Mm -hmm. and. It's a matter of the, the, the drivers aren't compliant and conforming enough, are they? <laughs> yeah. They are more compliant and conforming. If they followed instructions better... We need more instructions. <laughs> you know, often, if you, set, if you stop at um, a stoplight junction and you count the number of lights, there's often more lights than there are cars at the junction. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you want to really get a great illustration, you know that time in, in the, at 2 a.m. in the morning and you're sat at the traffic lights, it says red. Yeah. There's no cars for miles, but yeah. it says red and you think, well, I've, I've got to follow those instructions, haven't I? There might be a camera. Yeah. And you sit there, well, there's a great opportunity to count the lights then because you've got nothing else to do and there's no other reason why you stopped there other than that was the instruction. Yeah. And looked at in that context, they're really, really inefficient. But you can understand why it's, n it's nonsensical to imagine removing those commands, having less lights, removing the instructions would help. Because the problem with people not following instructions is going to get worse, surely. It's kind of logical. If they're not following instructions, do the instructions better. That's, that's kind of logical sense, isn't it? And yet roundabouts work better. So there's something, and it's all about the engagement of the individual. They start managing the problem themselves. So not only are they looking out for themselves and on a roundabout, they're also looking out what other people are doing. And there will be some people on that roundabout who are pursuing only their interests, yeah. making mistakes and doing all sorts of stupid things. And the important thing is you can still coordinate and navigate your path around them and to carry on pursuing your interests. 
so you're not heavily impacted because you you maintain situational awareness. Mm. You just you're just getting around all the the mayhem that's occurring. Yes. But you know we do this every day in our lives. Yeah. We're expert at this. It's not something. There's no magic to it. You just you if you're engaged in the problem you're you're trying to navigate through, you make sensible decisions. Mm. And self management is just all about taking away the instructions, stepping back, leaving the overall rule set of you know drive on the correct side of the road and give way to the right or left, depending on which country you're in. Mm. And using those simple instructions to 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 choose the most effective and efficient way of, of pursuing your own agenda. Yeah. Your own purpose. Yeah. I think this is this is a, a really crucial point because it's so easy to assume that a great set of rules and processes will somehow surely if you have just the right process. Yeah. It must be better than self management. It's gonna run like a like a well oiled machine, isn't it? Yeah. A Josh Matic. Why does that why does that not work? What, what what's going on? Like this is this is intuitively what we think about, isn't it? Like we we assume it must it must be like there must be the perfect process if we could just find it if you had the right management consultant helping us, yeah. right? You know those um those pictures of the North Korean army they all march and they have got those white gloves and the white boots and they they march in perfect step, don't they? Surely that's what we want. That <laughs> makes sense. I mean it's just it's capable. It's tidy, yeah. it's neat, and yeah, that's definitely the way forward. Surely. Mm. This actually just amazingly reminds me of um, Venkat Rao, who's a writer on organizational theory, and he says the problem is that what we care about is not effectiveness, but um, um, ordered orderliness. Orderly, totally different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we 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 obsess about it at work. Yeah. Now, look, a traffic light control junction doesn't work if you just take the lights out. Mm -hmm. You have to design it as a roundabout. So I'm not suggesting it's like anarchy where the problem is the traffic lights. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is that if you take the lights out, you just have to understand the principles you have to put in place so people can self-manage. Yes. And if you get those principles right, you can step right back and it'll just work. And it's efficient and effective and robust and resilient. So you can have somebody break down, their car break down on the, on the roundabout, and it'll still flow. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there are some principles of self-managing organizations, and they're kind of, they're not dynamic principles. They're like in the layer of a roundabout. As you approach it, you can see what the people on your side of the roundabout are doing. If there's a high fence down your carriageway, it wouldn't really work so well. Mm. And the, the fence or the lack of fence doesn't really have any dynamic effect on the drivers. The drivers are just, it just allows the drivers to do what they want to do for themselves. So yeah. if you have good software, they can maintain situational awareness. If you have no software, it's really difficult for anybody to make a, a decision with an overview of the organization because they only see their little bit. Yeah. So it's about putting in the things that help and taking out everything that hinders. Right. If you get effective design, um, I'm trying to avoid saying, I, I don't want to say that the layout of the roundabout manages the drivers. I want to be very clear that the drivers manage themselves, mm -hmm. but the layout is important. Yeah. It doesn't have any. There's no dynamic influence. Right. It's an environment, isn't it? It's a. It's a. Yeah. Context, and 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 I, as I understand it, there's a, it's a sort of a, it creates a set of uh, rules and patterns that you can recognize. So when you get to run, but you know what to do. I mean, there is a, there is a set of rules that you're following, but yeah. um, a, a, in some ways, as you said, it's like less dynamic than a light uh, than a traffic light because you don't have to look for the yet red, yellow, and green. Um, which is part of the system, you only have to look at the other actors in the system. Yes, yes, fantastic. And they are quite, they're hugely dynamic, the other actors. 
Right. The coordination is quite a difficult thing. But we're good at it. Yeah. People are great at that sort of stuff. Mm. So you mustn't and you mustn't say, well, the challenge seems so difficult. It'd be difficult to get a computer to work it all out. So surely a person can't do it. Well, the truth is, a person lives like that every day. So no. they're really good at it. Right. You never see the, um, you know, pedestrians walking across a park on a busy day, speed it up. You think, wow, yeah, that they they coordinate and collaborate in complicated ways. Groups form and disband, and people take shortcuts. All sorts of stuff goes on, and it's a flowing, dynamic thing. Yeah, and so this is, doesn't change. Yeah, and the amazing thing about that is it um, it sort of creates it, it adapts the system to be best suited to what we're really good at. Because if you're creating a set of procedures and rules that people have to follow step by step by step, you might as well replace the person with a machine. You know, if that's the outcome that you want, and yeah. increasingly that's what we're doing. So in any case, if the if it's possible that the process can be made so firm that it's you know it's going to be better than self-management probably it's something that machines are better than humans at so let's focus on, let's focus on the work that actually you know that's that's unique to humanity that computers can't do yeah so you know if i was to design a park i'd design the gates for access for the pedestrians and then i'd just let people wear the grass out wherever they want to walk to and that's where i put the paths mm. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm going to make it a nice ordered rectangle. I could put some flower beds in, and I'm going I'm to need loads of those keep off the grass signs, aren't I? <laughs> but yeah. if I just wait till the muddy tracks appear on the grass, that's where we'll put the path. Yeah, great. I don't have to design it. Yeah. So I'm trying to illustrate that whilst the, the environment affects behaviours, it doesn't manage them. So you have to make the environment so it facilitates self-management. The roundabout facilitates the drivers choosing what to do, when to do it, and how to cooperate and collaborate mm. and coordinate. And that's very different to the traffic light system, which directs them exactly, and they disengage from everybody around them. They don't need to know. Yeah. And you're trying to engage their brain, and it, the, the layout just looks different. It's not magical, it's not, you know, you're an, as much of an expert on roundabouts as I am. I can't be like a roundabout guru because you'd say, well, hold on a minute, Julian. <laughs> With all due respect, I know this already. Mm. But I can say, Josh, don't keep putting traffic lights in them. Don't keep putting signs on your roundabout because if you lay that out well, you don't need to explain it. Mm. Simple set of rules simple layout so people can coordinate together yeah yeah and that's sort of it, to me now I'm, I'm thinking about the next topic which is informal processes we were talking about that um last week as well and you, you the, the roundabout or you know the sort of self-management if you will you have some rules you have the um the constraints of the external environment brought in and everyone's aware of that um but a lot of what goes on between people when people work together is, is informal right Yes, of course it is. Yes, definitely. So okay. if you think about, oh, I don't know, if you think about your life, if you think about your finances, and you think about all the interactions you have with people in your life, like this one we're having now, like the one you're having with your internet service provider, right in this moment, they're not controlled by a formal contract moment by moment. Mm -hmm. There's this overarching contract that perhaps once a month you make a payment to. Mm -hmm. Most of the rest of the interactions and your use of the service is ad hoc and as you want it. It's really quite informal. Yeah. There's one transaction that probably appears on your bank statement, which is the formal transaction, the agreement between you, you and your service provider. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the formal agreements in an organization actually very few you can you can bring them down to a tiny little subset most of the interactions are informal okay, and usually the formal ones are about reflecting the law like tracking the assets around the business as they move and flow through from ingredients to to the pool car mm -hmm. most of the formal ones are tracking that mm -hmm. the activities honestly 
you, they don't you don't need to track mm -hmm. so I work on some ingredients and I make a, a cake and then I formally transfer the cake to you and you decorate it but the only real formal transaction needs to be that I transfer the cake to you all our negotiations and everything else that went on are complete can be completely informal it's just the record kind of the transfer of the ingredient of the um, cake to you so it's now on your balance sheet and not on mine but I get some cash and hopefully that cash should reflect the value that I've added to the ingredients mm. does that mean also that for example when you do internal transaction you may not specify like um, what the ingredients of the cake are even though that might be important to the person buying the cake but that's that's info is that part of the informal decision it may be that Let's imagine you were the buyer of the cake and you're going to have a birthday party and you're going to decorate it. And you may say, Julian, I want a cake. And I say, do you know, Josh, I can do that for you. And it's going to be $5. Mm -hmm. And you say, yep, fine. Oh, it mustn't contain gluten. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you're specifying something to me and I've got to use my creativity to work out, oh, blimey, that's a problem now because I was going to use like a ton of flour and it was definitely <laughs> going to be mainly made of gluten. Yeah. So I, I have to say to you, Josh, I can't do it. Or, do you know, I can. I'm going to look on that man who runs the internet and he'll know. He'll tell <laughs> me how to do it. So then I just buy the ingredients and make it happen. I'll say, look, it's, do you know, I've worked out I can do it for $6 now, Josh, before I take it on. And you say, oh, great. Normally they cost 10 <laughs> I think, damn. But <laughs> no, great. we've got a bargain. I'm going to do it. But I've had to use my curiosity and my imagination and my um, cooperation with you I've had to overcome a difficulty that I hadn't anticipated I've had to use self-discipline because you want a nice well-cooked cake and it's got to be right so there's a whole bunch of human stuff I'm bringing to the challenge mm. but really the only traceable transaction as far as you're concerned is five six dollars comes to me and you get the cake yeah what you want it and and the, the the relationship of trust that we have is sort of fundamental to that, isn't it? So, if, you know, I want a cake that's not just a cake, but it's also delicious, and you know, people. Yeah. But but we don't need to agree on that. Um, I just trust that that's what you will do because you're you're a professional. I think you have a have a degree of expectation. That's why you've come to me because I can make you a really good cake. Yeah. And in some ways, in the trust thing. I'm not sure you can give me trust. Okay. I'm, I think it, with trust, it feels much more like I've proven myself to be trustworthy. Mm. So I did a cake and it was okay. I did another cake and it was good. And I did a third cake and it was really good. And you said, you know, these Julian's cakes are pretty good. Mm -hmm. But you haven't had to give me trust. I've kind of earned it. Yeah. So if I'd done, oh, the first cake was really good, second cake was rubbish. I might not even get a third cake. <laughs> and it's me who's kind of broken our relationship because yeah. I've let you down Josh and I know I have because of the disappointment on your face you're going, mm, it's horrible this cake is <laughs> oh yeah lovely um, and you may not even say to me that it's rubbish you're just not going to order one for me again mm -hmm. so I want to get, get this sense that I like the idea of trust but I really like it from the point of view of individual earning trust it's about integrity it's like about doing what you say you're going to do mm. it's like being reliable mm. that's why you trust me because i've earned it but when it's from a position where you give trust it seems like i don't really have very much impact on trustworthiness because mm. it's all up to the giver not up to the receiver Right. I find that a tricky thing to do because I'd rather work in an organization full of people who are trustworthy than an organization of people who give trust. Yeah. Now, there are many people who say the outcome is the same. If you've got very trusting people, you end up with a trustworthy organization. Mm. And I, I think that's logically true, but I do know if people are trustworthy, everyone in the organization is very trusting. Right. 
I know one gets the other, but I'm not sure the last one gets the first. I, I, I get the distinction. It's sort of like um, if you're just, if everyone is just very trusting, regardless of the results, um, you, you end up with a pathology again that, that it might work in most of the time, but then it, some people will, will naturally fall into that failure to meet the expectations of others, and there's no repercussions for them. So it's possible, and I'm, I've never done the experiment. So I, you know, my best idea is it doesn't sound like, it sounds just as you say, you could fall into a pathology, which is undermining trust. Mm. But I do know if everyone is capable of earning trust, trust builds in an organization. Yeah, I'm curious if there's um, another distinction to be made around, um, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt or, um, you know, assuming that you can't trust people. Like, what's the first assumption? Do you assume that people are, are trustworthy? If, if a new employee joins the company, do you assume that whatever they say they can do, they can actually do? Or do you assume that they can't do anything and let them prove it? Okay, now I think this is where I would err more on the trusting side mm -hmm. because I always give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. So we'll expose them to the risk of failure and if they're trustworthy, they will do what it takes to to meet the the promise they gave. Yeah, and I guess it's the test of authenticity as well. If if they're if they know they can't do something, it's sort of their role to say, "Hold on a second, I yeah. should not do this thing." Yeah, and that's a that's a different form of trust, isn't it? Because they've come back and they've they've been communicative and open and authentic, as you say. Mm -hmm. So, um, I like that distinction you made there. How do you how do you start the relationship do you start it from a position of not being not trusting or do you start it from trusting and i say definitely trusting mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean to say the default position is always to trust mm -hmm. the default position is start with trusting so it's like the opening gambit is to trust and then from then on you're looking at how much trust that other person is earning mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it, it just reminds me of a, of a psychological experiment actually. And they when when you look at the sort of game theory experiments and they have agents that play games and that rely on trust, the, the, the best strategy actually for individuals, the most effective individual strategy is tit for tat, which is right, if if somebody um, cheats you or you cheat them back, if somebody treats you well and you treat them well back, reciprocity. Uh, but it turns out that the network as a whole benefits from individuals and, and everybody altogether benefits when the individuals have a, have a um, system of um, trust with some forgiveness. So um, usually you play tit for tat. If somebody cheats you, you cheat them back. But occasionally, now and then, you'll forgive someone. You say, oh, you cheated me, but let's, let's try again. Maybe, maybe you, you had a bad day and I'm going to trust you again, even though you just cheated me. But not all the time, otherwise it becomes pathological, right? Otherwise you're yeah. accepting cheating from other people. So I'm, think, I'm thinking about my experiences, say, in a, in a, I go into a shop and they shortchange me. Mm -hmm. It's an experience we either suspect that's happened to us or that actually happened to us in the past. So you go into a shop, they shortchange you, you walk out and you think, hmm. But I'm not sure I would enter into a a tit-for-tat response and say, do you know I'll go shoplifting? <laughs> That'll show him, won't it? I'll pop back in, and I'll slip down my coat and off I'll go. Yeah. I'm not sure I'd, I'd, I'd resort to that. I'd more likely, next time I go in, to say, I'm going to count my change this time, and I'm going to say to you, that difficult conversation, I think I was, I was shortchanged last time. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say to me, if you complained at the time, perhaps we could sort of that out. But you've left it a week. Mm -hmm. And I you see they're right. Yeah. So now I'd say, if I felt I was shortchanged, I have to talk, I have to speak up straight away. Mm. I'm not sure I'd enter into a tit for tat response. Sure. Because I can't see any, it's going to end up with some sort of massive turf war in my local shopping precinct, you know, because <laughs> it's not, it doesn't help us live together, does it? No, yeah. Now, this is a super simplification based on the yeah, yeah. theory. Yeah, so yeah. I, but I, I, and I like this theory of <laughs> the game theory, but in practice, I think we're a bit more pragmatic than that. 
Yeah. And as an engineer, I tend to be much more pragmatic and say, look, tip for tat doesn't work. I wouldn't I do experience and I observe people in our organization feeling let down by another person. And they don't. They'll do two things. One is they'll have a difficult conversation and say, I feel really let down. Or they'll choose not to, because um, all our transactions are voluntary, they'll choose not to participate in um, transactions with them. Yeah. And that may go on for a little while. And their concerns may be st substantiated by other people experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. At which point, the culture starts trying to address the poor behavior. Right. On the other hand, it might have just been a one-off thing, like you said. And the individual will be watching other people transacting and saying, well, they're not having an issue. Why did I have an issue? Yeah. And then they may tentatively go back into another uh, an agreement with the individual to see if they get a better response. Yeah. But I have to say, Josh, that if you're going to be authentic at work, there's going to be some people you don't get on with as well as others. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to, if you're a manager, if you're an overview of those sorts of organizations, you have to accept that there's going to be uh, uh, distortions in patterns of behaviors which you can't fix and they're not really, um, you, you can't intervene in them. The personality issues of one sort or another. Mm. I never like that fella. Or well, why not? Oh, he reminds me of my brother-in-law. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, let's change his face. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what can we do about that? There's nothing. Yeah. You know, you have to. Um, you have when people are authentic. You have to accept that's how they are. They're not objective. They're often subjective. Mm. You have to embrace that. Yeah. You know, there are some people who turn up at a roundabout and when they, they come to that the entrance of the roundabout they'll stop they don't merge with the traffic moving around the roundabout they stop yeah. and that's because they're not they don't have the confidence to merge and you can't say right we well, are not allowed in a roundabout mm. you have to accommodate them mm. and it's not the roundabout's fault it's not the individual's fault they're just part of the the natural spectrum of humanity yeah. we can't exclude them for that So um, I'm trying to express that this, there's no nirvana in self-management managing organizations. Mm -hmm. You just have a different set of problems. Ah, and here I thought you were the guru. No. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> about roundabouts. What you need is, is uh, Leylandi. They work really well in the middle there. They don't need any mowing. You know, they're fantastic low maintenance plants. <laughs> but, I'm no guru of roundabouts and I'm no guru of self-managing systems. You are already, you know that, that's how you live your life. Yeah, yeah. You're an expert on roundabouts and you're an expert on the way you get through your life. You make huge, important, significant decisions in your life and you've done well. I always think about the fact that most people earn for their organization possibly about three times their pay. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a rule of thumb that if somebody can earn three times their pay, they're worth employing. Mm -hmm. Two times their pay, probably not covering their cost with that management hierarchy above them. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of three times their pay, which means in three years, you'll be personally paid all the money that you earn for a business in a year. Look at it like that. Yeah. Now it's really weird if that organization doesn't trust you with that sort of size of budget. Mm. Don't you think? Because in three years, you, you spend that and you manage it yourself in your personal life. Mm. They wouldn't employ you if you couldn't. Mm. Yeah, at work, if you want like a ream of paper, what did you do with the other paper, Josh? <laughs> Actually, now somebody mentioned me about paper airplanes. I'm not saying it was you. <laughs> but it, it was somebody with glass and a red jumper. I'm not saying it was you, and it came from your window. <laughs> and you're getting through that paper. Yeah. And the question is, look, in your personal life, you manage your paper quite happily. You manage a huge budget quite happily. You make massive investments in a house and multiple years of your income, you'll commit to a loan on a home. Mm. And yet at work, you can't buy a ream of paper. That's yeah. kind of weird, isn't it? It's bizarre, actually, yeah. 
So it's like that traffic light system, which not only tells you when to go and when to stop, but which gear to be in and how to be sat and which way to point the steering wheel and where, where the heater control should be. You're <laughs> micromanaged at work by a traffic light system. Yeah. And um, it's hugely expensive. Right. Yeah. So, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's, as you say, the, the, then what happens is if you have a problem, you, you know, people do the, let's have more traffic light solutions. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and and that makes the situation worse in the long term. Maybe short term it does make things better. It may be short term, you know, you figure out why are people behaving in one way and you create a rule about that and you fix it slightly and like a patch. Yeah. Like a doctor who treats the symptom. Yeah. So how many elastoplasts will you have on your arm before you say, Do you know these the ninth one isn't really working? <laughs> But we do this all the time at work. Yeah, yeah. We have overtime to fix the problem we were getting behind on a project. 25 years later, we've, there's more overtime than anything else. Yeah. And our projects are actually later than they've ever been. Yeah. We just treated the symptom and treated the symptom and treated the symptom and treated the symptom. With the Einstein who says it's madness mm -hmm. to have the same response to a problem and think you're going to get a different result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to, oh, actually, I've just realized we're, we've been talking for uh, nearly an hour and a half, so. You're going to have some good stuff to edit now, aren't you? <laughs> um, we're going to put the whole thing online, I think. Um, okay. Um, well, there's, there's plenty of other things to talk about. I was going to launch another conversation <laughs> about the parallelism that you have, but um, let's let's wrap it up in the next couple of minutes. What, what would be like some closing thoughts about this whole topic? So the whole topic, the closing thoughts, my closing thoughts are to demystify self-management. We're all familiar with it. It's just the difference between traffic lights and roundabouts. It doesn't need any special insight. We all understand how it works. We all live our lives self-managing. The fundamental difference is when you start a business, you're a self-managing business. There's two million self-managing businesses in the UK, single person businesses, they have to do everything and they self manage. Right. At some point, they increase in size, and they either get themselves an assistant or a colleague like an equal. Mm. And if they get themselves an assistant, they start the hierarchy. Mm. They get themselves a colleague like a franchise like a somebody who's delivering the same like two plumbers working together, rather than a plumber and his assistant. When you've got two plumbers working together, that's the sort of systems that we use in our organization. It's just self-management and it's teams of equals. So we have that critical moment when a business expands, do they go self-managing or do they go hierarchical? And it's really tough to transition between the two. Yeah. You need a crisis. <laughs> now as a consultant, I can supply that. <laughs> I'm sure I could come into any, almost any business and really, really cause havoc. Yeah. <laughs> have a crisis, and then you're in a great position to transition between the two. <laughs> I, but really, you don't need me. Most businesses are in crisis anyway. Yeah. There's another big issue with, of the younger generation is I think they've got different expectations of work. They expect work to be somewhere where they can express themselves more fully. Mm. And I think education today prepares them for a workplace that doesn't exist. Yeah. I think the workplace they expect is somewhere they can express themselves and in fact it's not, it's somewhere trapped in the 20th century or even the 19th century which is command and control and I think the younger generation find that very difficult. You know your experience with the music industry for example is self-publishing mm. whereas the most organizations that, um, especially the big brands that people go to work for, the traditional ones, they're like the music industry from the 50s. It's all super controlled and it's regulated and huge, with huge barriers to entry and lots of agents. So you've got the producer of the music and you've got the consumer of the music and there's this agent between who skims off a whole bunch of money and puts a whole load of barriers in place. Yeah. And all the people are Napster did is they connected the consumer with the producer for, with very little cost in, in between. Yeah. 
and that's the that's the model that most of the younger generation greet the world with they don't need an intermediary they don't need an agent and that's why i'm big on this idea that you know i don't need to be your guru you're the expert of self-management you don't need me as an agent yeah yeah incredible i hope that uh, a very young person goes out and creates their own business and creates a self-managing business because it yeah i imagine it will be easier than trying to box yourself into the square that the organizations want you to be and it's tremendously low cost and it makes work a pleasure yeah. so it's definitely the way to go from my experience it's transformed my life hmm. well, actually, that, that's a good question what, what is it that you do now that you've put yourself out of a job <laughs> out of a job as a manager yeah, that's a good question. Hey, so I'm, a, I'm an investor and I, I have assets um, deployed in the organization. Mm. And the people in the organization are stewards of those assets, but they're still mine. So it's a, it's a conventional business in that sense. Mm. So I, sh I share with them the rewards of them deploying those assets. So mm. they give me a proportion of the rewards. And it provides me a handsome living, so I'm happy about that. Mm -hmm. It also gives me an investment opportunities I can look elsewhere. Yeah. Also, there's a bunch of people in the organization now who have ideas of their own in ways in which they want to deploy more capital in areas of their specific interest. Mm. And they, given their experience in the organization, they're a tremendously good investment. They know all the laws, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not just winging it. Mm. Um, and they're multi-skilled and, and uh, the barriers to entry are, are fantastically low. So this, I, um, I'm a landlord because I own the building and they pay me rent for it, just normal commercial rent. If they weren't in there, somebody else would be in there. Mm -hmm. um, software is something, I'm always looking for ways to improve that roundabout. Mm -hmm. To say, you know, what really, mostly, what can we remove? Mm -hmm. What don't we need to have? And I wish I was a motivator of that, but they're saying, Julian, why do you have to pay you for this? <laughs> because I'm kind of a supplier to them. I supply roundabouts to them. And they say, well, you know, all these curb stones, they look too fancy to me. Mm. You've written your name on all of them, Julian. I think, <laughs> can't we? Oh, okay. oh, yeah, okay. I suppose we could. <laughs> but they're looking to make their, the infrastructure that they, they're employing as cheap as possible for them because it, it makes them as slick as possible. Mm. And I'm not there to say they can't do that. It's up to them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so really, I'm I'm looking to nurture people to create new entrepreneurs to then deploy the capital we're generating together. And I, I also have to say that there's there's quite a lot of capital that they want to bring into the organisation too and deploy of their own. Mm -hmm. Because I told you we pay them well, and they're kind of saying, well, interest rates being what they are, can't we deploy our own capital within the business? <laughs> I'm like, oh, sure, hold on a minute here. You know, I don't want. I don't want your capital going in mind being pushed out, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, there's a deal to be done because mm -hmm. it, it's a fact. All we say, well, yeah, let's do it because I don't, I don't want to force them out by me being greedy in it. Yeah, but we we have to together to see you know, how can we collaborate to get something out that we all want. And I understand they want to stake in what they do. That makes absolute sense to me. My challenge is how how are we going to do it together rather than yes or no it's, it's not really my decision mm -hmm. and inevitably they want a zero risk enterprise <laughs> they, they want to put the capital in but with zero risk yeah. and i want to have my capital in because i see it as the best return possible yeah. but we're open and honest you know in that conversation and we kind of work out how we can do this like you getting a lift to work with your friend how are you going to do it who's going to pick whom up from where and who's going to pay for the petrol and where you're going to park and who pays for parking and what happens if you get back to the car and it's raining and you know your friend's not there already you're going to just get wet those are things to organize but him or you you wouldn't make the rules you'd have to collaborate wouldn't you yeah get together yeah and that's how that's how yeah how life works and that's how Organizations can work as well. Yeah, you're an expert, I and I'm. It. I don't need to teach you how to do it. You know already. Yeah. Wow. The only, the only difficulty is that somehow we get programmed to follow. We always get an assistant. Mm. 
Uh, why is that? I don't know. You know your great grandfather would have recognised how most businesses operate today. He'd have scratched his head at Uber, scratched his head at Linux. Mm. The boy Coca Cola, he'd know exactly how that worked. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, in some ways we we were talking also last week about how it's kind of become dogmatic, right? The the structures of organisations is not it's not based on what works best. No. It's based on what the 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 high priests of our society mm -hmm. say. Yeah, the gurus. Yeah, the the Harvard Business Review will write all about how you can run an organisation. Yeah, there's a great um, there's a great piece of work by that guy Rod Beckstrom who talks about the starfish and the spider. Mm -hmm. So a starfish is kind of has five arms and a spider has eight legs, and they kind of superficially look the same. But if you cut a leg off a spider, you get a, a, a crippled spider. If you cut its head off, it dies. Mm -hmm. But if you cut one of the arms of a starfish, the starfish will grow that arm back. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are some species of starfish that if you cut all their arms off, all five arms off, five new starfish grow out mm -hmm. of the arms. Wow. And it's because starfish are decentralized organisms. Whereas the spider centralized has got a head and a nervous system, and the starfish has got a, a single nerve fiber ring that runs around all its arms, and they can exist separately from each other. Wow. But together, collaboratively, they do better than they can on their own. Yeah. But they're not dependent on each other. Yeah. So and it's a great analogy, a great metaphor for looking at organizations. Linux, clearly a decentralized organization. You know, they, 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 they are great enemies today, like Al-Qaeda, they're decentralized organizations. Mm. And they're not like the old USSR. They're not, we don't, we don't have symmetrical warfare anymore. You know, you're not gonna send your nuclear submarines after their nuclear submarines. They don't have them. Mm -hmm. They have a mobile phone and some fertilizer and a dustbin lid. You think, well, how are they knocking down our helicopters? Hmm. But that's the challenge for the conventional wisdom. They can't outthink decentralized organizations. They're, 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 there's too many experiments going on, and only one needs to work, and they all copied that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of scary. <laughs> it is, but the truth is, you know, our, our military are responding to it. You know, there, there's much in, a greater increase of the deployment of special forces who, are, who look just like decentralized organizations. Mm -hmm. They say, go and do your thing, come back here in six months and we'll take, take you out. Mm -hmm. It's not about, well, you know, have your heat control at number seven. And when the light goes red, you, you stop. And then when it goes green, you pull away, but you look left. It's none of that. You train them to be multi-skilled and you lead, lead them to do the job. Yes, this is super interesting, actually. The, Simon Sinek wrote um, Leaders Eat Last, you know, based partially on his experience working with the Marines, because he said that the, the leadership, when you look at the, the th things like loyalty and performance and all sorts of things, it's just incredible compared to any organization, not just other military units. Yeah. So this the self organization is not unique to these weird businesses it's happening all over the place mm. it's happening in the music industry it's it's and it's a very familiar thing to us it's just really really unusual in traditionally organized organizations and they don't really understand it yeah, yeah. and the likelihood of them transitioning from one to the other is very very low yeah i just had the the thought that i never thought about wikipedia being like that but when you mentioned linux i thought wikipedia is kind of also very self-managed. I mean, when you think about the millions of contributors, yeah, there's nobody saying, "Oh, create an article on that." No, somebody says, "I I like to talk about. I like. To, I'm an expert on this. I want to create an article on this." And they just do. The, the truth is, self-managing organizations, or kind of hybrid self-managing organizations, are all around us. Yeah, I mean, the trust thing on eBay. When you rate a seller and a buyer, that's all about establishing the trust you were talking about earlier. Mm. And the opening gambit is. I trust them to deliver on time, I'll make the purchase. But after that, you're looking at, well, you know, how trustworthy have they been in the past? 
and I'll now decide whether to purchase off them depending on their previous behavior. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't think there's a tit for tat. I don't think you order stuff and then you cancel it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, they did somebody down. I'm going to get them. You charge them. I don't think it works like that. I know it might work like that in theoretical game theory, but you know, in real life, it doesn't work so much like that. Mm. Um, so these things are all around us, and we're super familiar with them. It's just unusual in McDonald's. You just, it's not how it works. Mm. I, I'm wondering, though, whether is there a difference between you know, something that you do online and something that you do in person? I imagine the amount of um, the how much you can agree to in a comp inside a company like yours is a lot, lot higher than you might agree to online because you don't know the people, even if there's a star rating system, you know, you tell yourself, well, this person's five star rated and probably you trust the fact that eBay or Amazon or whatever other company is running the platform will mediate disputes. Whereas in kind of true self-management, there's almost there's no need to mediate disputes because the trust is so high, but or the, you know because they're face to face. Yeah, it's one to one, and it's in real time, and um, the the interaction is personal. I think what you're saying there is because of the degree of anonymity that occurs online, mm -hmm. you have to have an increased degree of of a third party who who mediates problems, mm -hmm. but in our personal life, we do that one to one. You hardly ever get a judge involved in mediating a dispute with your neighbour. Yeah, things have gone real bad by the time you get there. Yeah. And in, in our organisation, I don't see things progressing to that real bad level because our interaction is voluntary. Yeah. People just say, "I move. I'm not. In, I'm not interact with this individual because I don't. I'm not comfortable." Because he looks like my brother-in-law, <laughs> and you think, well, sure. "Okay, do you know?" Okay, yeah, it's okay. You can move to the other side of the yeah. of the company. Move your desk over there, and it's no problem at all. Yeah. yeah, go where you please. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so so you, you're absolutely right to say it's about the design of the roundabout. If you've got an organization which is dogged by the anonymity of the transactions and interactions, there's probably going to have to be things you have to put in place. Mm. But that's not the same as saying everyone needs it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's, let's wrap it up. <laughs> it's uh, been an hour and 40 minutes and I'm just wary also and probably you, you want to you get home and <laughs> do everything else. Um, so Thanks, it's been great to talk to you, Josh. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I think it's been very, very enlightening um, about what's possible and, and, and actually just how kind of obvious it, it might be. <laughs> well, yeah, this, already. This is not. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate it, and I'm sure that um, people who were here live um, and people who will watch this later on on YouTube will get a lot of value out of it. So, thanks a lot. Any questions you got? Throw them over. Okay, thanks. Take care. Bye. Hope you have a good evening, and we'll talk later. Cheers. Bye bye. Ciao.